Hello everybody, my name is Minkaro, and welcome to The Wolf Among Us. Now I'm going to have a look at the favourite entries I've unlocked from episode 4. So let's get right into that. Silver Bullets, Wolf's Weakness. The legends of great and magical wolves often make a mention of their weakness against weapons made out of silver. And those tales bear out to be true. The silver bullet Mary shot Bigby with was not the first, but any of them could have been his last. Any silver left in Bigby's body weakened his system, slows his healing and can cause long-term damage. Okay. Acting Deputy Snow White With Ichabod Crane firmly out of the picture, and King Cole still absent, the task of leading Fabletown falls squarely on Snow's shoulders. She has performed many of the job's duties for a long time, picking up the slack for Crane. But now that she's fully in charge of the business office, she has to deal with a whole new level of politicking she had not previously been exposed to. Donkey Skin Coat Hide in plain sight. Only the truly beautiful will fully understand the power of a coat that makes his wearer appear ugly. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose I do know that. It is a power to be invisible or still being seen. Unfortunately, its value can also be hard to see. But it is still a magic coat, and to some collectors, that is enough. The Jersey Devil, Garden State Goon. Not all of the fables who came to this world landed in Fable Town. There are those who scattered across the farthest corners of the earth, and there are those who simply prefer the Garden State to the Empire State. Such is the Jersey Devil. Reports of its appearance have varied, although most accounts make mention of leathery wings. But an encounter with a certain axe of legend some years ago has temporarily rendered that feature absent. A woodsman's axe. Ensorcelled. Ensorcelled. What the bloody hell is that? Ensorcelled by druids, I think. Once just a simple tool for felling trees, the axe became much more than that when it was. Magicked, yeah, magicked by druids and marked with their runes. But it truly became an object of legend when the woodsman used it to slice the big bad wolf from nave to neck in protection of Little Red Riding Hood. It may carry old world charm, but its simplicity of design and quality workmanship make it an effective tool or weapon even today. Johan the Butcher. His name is often said in the same breath as that of the baker and the candlestick maker of Fable Town. And like those other tradesmen, Johan the Butcher's storefront has served Fable Town for ages. Fresh cuts, exotic meats, and even full size of beef for the vigorous appetites of ogres and trolls. But Johan's business has fallen on hard times and fallen in with the wrong crowd, as the quality of his products declined and his business turned into a front operation for the Crooked Man, some have started to wonder if they ever really knew Johan. Bluebeard's Money One might think that Bluebeard donates funds to the Fable Town government for nefarious purposes, seeking special favours, or to have a louder voice in government proceedings. But what he really wants is stability and strength. Because as far as Bluebeard is concerned, Fable Town exists to insulate him from the Monday world. As much as his money can be a sword, it also serves as a shield. The Crooked Lair Headquarters Occupying a desanctified church, 
This is just one of many locations for Crooked Man's operation uses to run with Fabletown Underworld. Its lounge atmosphere makes for a comfortable meeting place. Unless you are an unwelcome guest, it is completely boarded up to the outside world and the only way in is through one of the many portals marked by a door with the Crooked Man's Catherine Wheel icon scattered through the city and elsewhere. Now, I am not the quickest person in the world, you probably know this if you watch my videos, but I've just realised when we were watching the Crooked Man's door in the mirror, it changed doors. It changed doors after Snow White said, I don't know where that is. It changed to a place that they recognised. The Crooked Man knew they were watching and knew he had to change the door location to somewhere they could find him. The crafty bugger. Yeah, I think everyone here watching that is like, yeah, we, we knew that. I mean, you know, we, you're having a light bulb moment over there, and everyone else's light's been lit up for ages. The Crooked Man. Crime Lord. I mean, at least a Time Lord then. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? The Crooked Man has slowly built himself into one of the most powerful figures in Fable Town. His operation started with a crooked sixpence and a crooked house. Two things he cared about more than his wife or children, whom he killed rather than let them stand in his way. In his rise, the crooked man has ensnared many fables in his criminal web, providing them with what they need, but always at a high cost. He is cunning, persuasive and ruthless. Tiny Tim Sentry while most fables theorise that their longevity and overall well-being is improved by the Monday World's knowledge of them, for a select few, that does not seem to apply. When a malady or injury is an integral part of a fable story, that notoriety can make recovery nearly impossible. That's what Tani Team thinks, at least. And no medical care or magic rather than none that he can afford, can heal his leg. Life on the farm. With its idyllic location and managed community, the farm would seem to be a welcoming alternative to eking out an existence in Fable Town, but those who have lived there see it very differently. They see it for what it is. A place... Oh, sorry, a prison. A place where you are free to be who you are, and do whatever you please, except leave. It doesn't help that fables who appear human do not have to worry about them being sent to the farm. They always seem to fill the leadership roles there. Ah, some interesting things in that uh, run of... Uh, what do you call them? Books of fables. Yeah, that's it, I knew that. Anyway, uh, I'll see you next time. Take care. Goodbye.